Hey everybody, it's Damien Gurgiev from The Break It Down Show, and today's guest is Eric Plansman. Eric returns to The Break It Down Show. He used to be P.T.A. Turner's commander in Bosnia when they were in the might of 165th military battalion. You'd imagine that commanding a company of spies would be the pinnacle of one's career, but that's just the beginning. Eric has authored books on intelligence analysis, found the 9-11 hijackers before 9-11, helped solve the D.B. Cooper case, and a lot more. It's always a good time when we hear from Eric. Hey, if you want to support the Break It Down Show, go to breakitdownshow.com and donate to the PayPal link. You can also buy our merch through our website and you can watch our videos for free on YouTube. Also, don't forget to donate to our veteran friends at savethebrave.org. We fight together PTSD. All right, here comes Eric Kleinsmith. Lions Rock Productions. <laughs> This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Eric Kleinsmith, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. I love these episodes. I mean, we get to... So if everybody doesn't know, I always say this, but because it's cool to say, uh, over 20 years ago, Eric yeah. Kleinsmith was my commander. When I was a spy in the army, he commanded. Delta Company. Yeah, I know. It's 25. Really, he's really got to transition that to 25. He commanded Delta Company 165th MI Battalion, the uh, the Delta Rocks Company. And uh, we deployed to Bosnia together. He actually, he joined us in Bosnia. We were already deployed at that point. And so he, his job was to manage a bunch of interrogators and interpreters and counterintelligence people running freely across the battlefield and uh, try to figure out what the heck to do with us. He had what, 15 or 16 teams? Is that right? Uh, we had uh, 16 teams and then we absorbed uh, First Armored Division, had a team that was uh, they had a single team that was, quote unquote, out there flapping. So they were out there on their own causing all kinds of problems. So they rolled them into us partway through the year just to give them some parental guidance. Now, look, I mean, you have 16 teams. They're not all going to perform at the same level. What was, How many teams would you say were useful in, in the field of the, of the 17 or 16 teams? That had? Uh, honestly, it's, and the, the deciding factor was not – the team itself, but where they were and who they were. Mm. So, you know, we had a team out at the Nord Norwegian Polish, yeah, uh, Polish brigade. We up and then we sent one team, uh, Chief McDermott, and I think uh, I kind of can't remember who, who the NCOs were went with them, but we sent him down to the Polish brigade uh, headquarters, and they and they had a you know those guys were doing great. They had lots of leeway, lots of. But then you had a team, you know, up at, I think you were up at uh, Camp Angela or, or one of the northern ones and whatever brigade headquarters that were there, they, they wanted you guys just to run copy and do guard post detail and they didn't want you going off post, you know, you know that, that yeah. kind of thing. So that's the, you know, it, it really depends on who, who allowed the, the, you know, what com local commander allowed their, their team to operate more freely in their area. Yeah, we were fortunate that our, we did a good job initially, made a great first impression with our commander. Yeah. And uh, and he pretty much let us do whatever we wanted, and we just you know as long as we gave them yeah. intel, that was what they uh, that was right. what they wanted. Um, right. Why are American units so bad at letting counterintelligence human collectors go out and do their damn job? Why are they so restrictive? Why do they not want to allow uh, incentive use and all these other things that we're supposed to be able to do? Why do they want to hem us up? They, they know better. They have a two. They right. know better. Right. Well, the, the part the part of the problem is. We lost our ability to understand risks and to measure risks mm. uh, across the board. And so, and that, and, and I hate to say it, but the Balkans was one of the worst examples of the bunker mentality and the, mm. and the criteria for the commander, you know, for peacekeeping operations. Once you've, once you've maintained peace, the only measure of success for the commander is, did you bring everybody out that you, that you brought in? Uh, did, you know, did you take and, and to do that, you had to take zero risk. And so getting off the base camp was a was, you know, monumental effort. You know, you you, you went through the process. I mean, I, uh, how many times we, we had to get approvals just to do a simple mission? I mean, we we even had an identified threat that was 
commuting in and out of Tuzla using the rail system. And so we wanted to get a team on the train. We could not get anybody within our leadership to let two of our guys get in plain clothes, get on the train, just ride it from one city to the next, because if something had happened on the train, there was no way for, they were talking about planning of, well, we should have a helicopter hover over it the entire way. So in case something happens, it's, you know, a team can jump out and extract these guys. It's like, they're just going through the morning commute with the rest of the Bosniaks, yeah. you know, for, for an hour ride. It's you, you can't let these guys go for that. You know, that was the amount of adverse aversion to risk that we had. So that's honestly what I feel followed us into Iraq and Afghanistan as well. You know, once, once the combat operations had stopped, the bunker mentality set back in and nobody wanted to leave the base camp. Well, then the whole country starts going to hell. And, you know, that, and then that bunker mentality gets even more, you know, uh, it gets even more reinforced that, you know, there's no way we're going out and doing these routes because there's IEDs along the roads or whatever. We're, we're not letting anybody out for anything. And that's until we can break that mentality. I hate to say it wasn't until uh, 2006. Um, I, I think it was with Petraeus or, or whoever was the, the new architect of this is how we're going to do the surge in Iraq. We, they had to break that mentality first. And that's still, you know, w- when your career is based upon, you know, how many losses of soldiers you took, not did you succeed in the mission that, you know, that's the problem. When you're afraid to go out and this is, this is the counterintelligence guy me talking. When you're afraid to go yeah. out and operate, you are, you become the operation. You know, I always yeah. would encourage like young, uh, yeah. age, young collectors who was running who. And if you're right. not coming out, you're being run by whoever shows up to do whatever. Right. And also, where's the counter surveillance of the surveillance that's clearly happening because we never went out. So the surveillance comes right up to the gate, tries yeah. to penetrate the camp all well, the time. Who's counting? That, that was a problem is we had somebody had caught it was one of the northern base camps. It might have been yours that had caught a Japanese tourist taking photos of the U.S. of the front gate. And so they went out there, detained him. They brought it in. We had one Japanese linguist in our entire country who could interrogate this guy. You know who it was? It was Chaz Owen, the first star. <laughs> but we could not get a convoy put together to get him up there to question this guy. And so what did the, the local unit did? They used some armor or infantry lieutenant who was Japanese descent. And he started his own untrained interrogation of these guys. And by the time somebody with authority got in there, they had stripped this guy naked and he was hogtied. I mean, it was just everything, every bad interrogation you've seen from the movie they had done to this poor tourist who just happened yeah. to be taking some photos. And it was just, you know, you know that's, you know, that risk, the, the, the inversion of risk just to send a guy in a convoy up there to talk to this guy, that became a huge fiasco. So <laughs> I was clear. I always complain about our level of training. I saw John Murray a couple of weeks ago. He's another counterintelligence agent, uh, someone I respect. And, and I just said, like, I was an E4 before, you know, when we deployed. So I don't know, but it seemed like they didn't train us to do our job. Like, what did I literally had no idea? Yes, I knew my job was to talk to people, right. and that right. kind of thing, but no training. And then I think about an armor unit or some CAV unit. They have no idea. Like, they have less than no idea. They have the wrong idea. At least I knew, like, I could get in trouble for doing this stuff wrong. Yeah. Um, how does what, what basic skills would you want? Like if you were going to be a, a colonel of a, of a battalion with, you know, CI asset or a human asset, what basic skills would you want to give your guys before they deploy? What would be important to you? For, for any kind of soft, you know, I guess they, we call it chaos, uh, the civil humanitarian assistance uh, um, was the operational support teams that, you know, Anybody that wasn't a bullet thrower or a bullet, somebody who was doing combat arms, you know, they were responsible in operating in very independent teams by themselves to, you know, to do that kind of work. I mean, there are certain, obviously, you know, you take great precautions and protections when you send folks out there like that. But you have to, you have to give these guys a broad set of intent. They have to be wired into the intent of the mission and, and then let them open up to operate within that intent. That's, yeah, that's it's it's just simple doctrine, but when it gets to practice, like why don't we why why did we not do this? Mm. You know, so and, and I went and I've I actually saw some of the training that took place before the initial uh, units went into the into Bosnia on the yeah. peacekeeping mission, and it was you know some of it was trying to like a crash course on 
you know, how do we deal with checkpoints? How do we deal with non-combat operations? But a lot of it was, they called it validation. Mm. And no unit could go unless they were validated by some, you know, somebody up the chain. That's, so that it was almost like we're doing this for our own professional liability. Right. Right. You know, it's, you know, this guy screwed up and he shot around into the barrel. Well, wasn't he validated before he went to go not to do that? Yeah, well, then that's his fault, not the commander's fault. You know, and that's, you know, it, it seemed... It seemed to us, and I was even in a in a different unit at the time, but we were doing uh, observer control or supporting that yeah. that training, and it was a lot of CYA that was going on. It's just you know, and unfortunately, that's in, when when you've got a peacetime army that's gotten you know that that has had you know slowed down in terms of their outlook or, or lost focus on what what the actual threat is, you know, you're going to run into that. I mean, we're we're, we're constantly facing that today. Yeah. One of the things that I've always uh, uh, thought about too is is we had a medal, a, a mission essential task list. This is for the audience, and mm-hmm. it's like these are the things that you need to be able to master to be a proficient unit. And there right. were just a zillion things like these things couldn't all be essential because you can't do all of them because right. you have to operate, you have to provision, you have to do all these things. And then yeah, how do you yeah. go outside the wire and do this? And right. there was more things that we can handle. And then like you said, you had all of the validation training which was how to convoy, how to uh, do some basic first aid. And a lot of this stuff we knew, so it was good to brush up on it. Yeah. But when you pile all of that training together, it's it's a mountain that's bigger than the time that you've yeah. got to train on it. You know, well, I mean, didn't just yeah. didn't focus on the day-to-day stuff. And that's, and that's how, you know, how do you set your priorities? And I, and I remember just saying to one commander of mine who, he was continually stacking up more things and more things and more things. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you could rightfully call him a workaholic, but you know, I finally said in a meeting as he was looking at it, it's like, what you know, you're looking at, the, he was you're looking at me like you don't agree. And I just finally just said, instead of doing th- 12 things half assed why don't we just prioritize the six things that you would absolutely have to do right and do those? And oh wow. man, was he bad. Yeah. But, you know, it had to be said. It's, I mean, he, he, I mean, he told me he respected me for saying it later, but boy, he was really pissed. The other thing I would I would want to encourage a commander to do is is uh, get a big ass so we can get chewed and let his team lead team chiefs know that like hey if you're not being employed I will take the ass chewing get it figured yeah. out you know I, I, I don't know what that exactly means but I means yeah. if you're if you're on guard duty if you're burning poop if you're doing all these other things that aren't your job you know I've got top cover for you you know right, right. you know um, there's there is a great you know, leadership example from the, the Band of Brothers series during the last missions into Hagenau, Germany, where they were had to go in at night. They, the, the regimental commander wanted a, a German POW uh, to interrogate, but then really to parade, to parade around that, that his guys were, did that mission. And it was successful. They did lose somebody, but then they, the, the commander wanted them to do it again the following, the following night. And the, and the, uh, battalion executive or the battalion commander then was uh, Dick Winters uh, basically said, you know, we're just going to send in a report that says you guys did it, didn't get anything and, and get some sleep. We're, get, we're pulling you off the line tomorrow. When I watched that, I, I think so many things rang in my head of how I had to do similar situations where, and that's, again, that's, you know, you have to take risks in leadership where I had to prioritize things because I knew we could only do, yeah. six of those 12 things and yeah. so and I, I had other, another commander who, who he would work himself to the bone the, the our, our headquarters commander he'd work until eight o'clock at night he'd be exhausted he was short he was uh, i mean short-tempered um you know he was incredibly frustrated all along he was you know you leave at six every six p.m every day after a 12-hour day he goes how do you get all your stuff done i just i looked at him it's like i don't because what do you mean he goes i i i I know what's important. I know what's what's not important, and I'm willing to take bumps on the things that I didn't get done because they're quite frankly not important. You know, yeah. that's is what it is. Yeah, I learned to take naps in combat, and whenever anybody said anything or I got the hint that someone's saying something, I would address it because it's just one of those things. Like this is how I, I'm a swing shift kind of guy or a split shift kind of guy. Yeah, and uh, I promise there will still be a war going on when I wake up in ninety minutes. You know, right. I promise. Right. I promise when and I go to meet them and everything else. Yeah, and that's the I keep telling the story to my friends about Chief Temby's bike. 
because some one of the warrant officers that went down there brought his bicycle with him, shoved it in the kind of container so right. he could, I don't know, bike around the countryside or whatever in, in, in a post-war torn, mine ridden you know, landscape. But somehow when we were packing up to leave, his bike was still there. And so we threw the bike in, you know, back in the Connex container. We threw some cam some netting over it to secure the whole thing. But when we had to do we had to had to get these things opened up for inspection, the entire company was formed up in front. And 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 our commander saw that and he was just livid at how bad, you know, how un, you know bad it looked with this random piece, these random pieces of equipment to include Chief Tumby's bike in there and he was just just screaming at me face to face top of his lungs in front of 150 soldiers and yeah. i you know you know of course you, you don't do anything you don't say anything you just say yes sir and you, you march out but i had two guys come up to me afterwards it was bart dashko and i think it was uh, uh sergeant bearclaw and they both came up and they said teach me the ways oh master and i said what are you talking about said, we we were gonna deck this guy I said, we, we'd have been thrown out of the military. How is it that you didn't touch this guy? And, and, you know, why didn't you lose your temper? And it's like, losing your temper is not the point. That's, yeah. you know, you, you can take any verbal, you know, any verbal abuse, but it's none of that, you know, it's none of that is worth it. You don't violate your principles just because you're getting frustrated or angry. So they said, and that's where they just said, please teach us how to keep, keep our yeah. temper. So. <laughs> yeah, well, and Bart talking to anybody was a fight, whether they knew it or not, because he was just such a combative conversationalist. You know, yeah, it well, was, I, I told to, my girlfriend, to "Go ahead." <laughs> I had to pull him off of a base camp because he got P and G. He, he pissed know. everybody off on the camps. So I was like, "Well, get, got to move the team." Is what for? Because they hate you now. So, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to say this too about top cover when I was in Iraq working in support of a whole bunch of CI teams and assets, we had made friends with the J two X who was the, the, the senior commander yeah. over all of the human assets for the, for the, right. um, this right. is like the entire theater. Right. And uh, he had said, Hey, if you guys ever need anything, let me know. And he was serious. He was an Australian officer under orders to not die. And uh, you know, okay. so he kind of like, he had the right kind of attitude and, and we were getting pushed around. We lived on a cluster of camps and there was a hunk of red zone right between. It was a road that was not secured. Um, and there had been bombs on it and everything else. And then, so he's like, you guys have to go through the contractor gate. We're like, yeah, but, but we're not that kind of contractor. We're like, we work with the counterintelligence teams. We interview, you know, and, and this guy knew all this stuff, but he had a hard yeah. on for contractors. And so we, they're like, so we have to go through the military gate with military vehicles. Great. So there was a 165th Humvee on the base camp we were on and belonged to the MI asset. Like I had a bunch of my steps and stuff we're like, Hey, we're going to borrow this for a couple of days. And they're like, yeah, we don't care. We're not going anywhere with it. Yeah. And so we would take it across the camp and it made this major mad at us for getting on the camp through the military gate. And he's like, you guys cannot go through the military gate, even with the military vehicle now. And so uh, I stopped and I said, listen, you have to understand what we do and what's going to happen. If you force us to go through this gate, we're not going to come over here and support you until it's safe to do so. And then we're going to go higher and understand our friends are all the way at the, at the very top level, the J level. And um, there's, you're going to have to deal with that because we do have top cover here. Because I learned my lesson in Bosnia. Right. And uh, he's like, yeah, we'll do your best. And I'm like, I'm telling you right now, the next thing that's going to happen is I'm calling the J2X and I'm going to ask him what we should do about this. And I promise you he's going to do something about it. And the guy's like, yeah, whatever. And he blew it off. And so, you know what? The next thing I did, I went down and I, I gave that. Australian officer an opportunity to get out of the off all palace for a day and right. a half. He's like, I've been dying to get out of here. You just gave yeah. me the best season ever. And, uh, it was bad for that major on that camp. And then he's like, why did you guys do that to me? Like <laughs> we begged you, you know, but yeah. we needed that top cover. Otherwise we would have been mission in Cape because we wouldn't have gone across the street. It wasn't, we can't be in line with the Iraqi guys driving the water truck, the food truck. We can't be in line with those people. It's right. just, not it's not safe to do it so anyhow um that's that top cover otherwise we would have been uh non-op and couldn't go across the camp to support all the other teams over there which is not that's not a satisfactory answer when people outside the gate dying right exactly you know that's you know again you you're you got to weigh those risks that's that's you know, the parts of, of you know it's it's different to be a manager than a leader and that's yeah. the biggest biggest piece and i had a, a great great boss who was a kind of a formal mentor who said, you know, if you're going to do something in the world of intelligence, one, you got to know your trade craft better than anybody. Yeah. You have to be a good manager. And for, for the life of me, goes, I don't understand why intelligence as a career profession brings in folks who, 
who disregard leadership as an important piece. Hmm. And that's, you know, and I, that, that was a very stark uh, example because the, the 165th, when I came to your unit, I, I had only been in combat units from that point on. And so for the, for eight years prior, I had only been in infantry or, or armor, you know, armor battalions or, or armor brigades. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I was the only Intel guy in those units for, you know, or, or just the, the extreme minority with just a small team of folks. As soon as I went to the Intel unit, I was just an eye opener shock of, of the, some of the games and some of the ridiculous things that were important. It's just like, this is not important. Why are we even doing this yeah. one thing or another? So, and I didn't realize that until about 20 years later, until I met enough guys in infantry units are like, what the hell kind of unit was that? And I'm like, that's how we did it. They're like, that yeah. is so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to, uh, I, I want to close that part of the show out because unless yeah. you want to say anything else, it is interesting though. And all these little stories, I think add up to how challenging it is to do our job and how dangerous it is. Yeah. But then when we get it right, when we're able to, you know, like one of the things I learned, it's like, it's a question for you. One of the things I learned from Bosnia was that my job to g- gather Intel is not to gather all of the Intel that's on the, sh- on the list of questions. Cause the questions are written in a vacuum somewhere else. Right. A lot of what we had to report back was, hey, there's nothing significant to report here, which isn't what you want to report. You want to report right. other things. Like, here is how the mission is going across the entire array of things it could be. You know, if there's not danger, where are areas where the commander can flex in resources and everything? And right. so a lot of, I learned that if I built a network that was powerful and I, I met and, and knew a lot of people, the information that was threat-based would flow into me. Everybody's looking for threat all the time. Ping, 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 right. ping, 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 pinging for threat. But then if you don't report back any other aspects of the mission, you can be absolutely failing to win as a commander, because, right. but you never hear about it because everybody, right. civil affairs, ag teams, whoever it is, they're always reporting how they're winning the war. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm writing an op-ed against uh, what Secretary Gates said the other day about how we should stay in Afghanistan and spend some more aid money. Like, no, we don't get to do that anymore. You, yeah. you, your plan did not work. You failed. I watched the ag teams. He talks about girls being in school. I went to those schools two days later when they weren't schools anymore. You know, and I I talked to the army units. You didn't know how many schools were in the area. These are the kind of things I focused on. And I would say 95% of what I focused on was that. Did I get threat-based intel? Of course. But I let that flow in through my network. And I let everybody else work because everybody else is working on that. But when I'm going to the commander with stuff that he can action on, and it doesn't have to be lethal, that's so much more powerful to them, especially when you can't. When the level of threat is not what you think it is, because you're only looking for threat, does that make sense? Right. Yes. Well, or you're or you're only looking for a certain type of threat, you know, right. or you, you're only looking, looking at certain areas. I mean, for in the Balkans, the, the reason why we we were, you know, fairly effective, we we were the only game in town in terms of intelligence for a while, yeah. Yeah. and there'd be reports that would come back down from the major three letter agencies about this is our 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 intelligence summary of what's going on in the Balkans. And our team, you know, our operations team again is like, we wrote this. <laughs> you know, this is just cyclical reporting. We're the only ones that are really doing any collection yeah. because, again, we're the only ones that were able to get off the base camp in less than four vehicles and actually go do yeah. the missions that we're, we were able to do. Nobody else was able to, to even get, you know, these the poor combat arms guys. God, they were they weren't doing anything. Our, our LERS, our LERS company. Their mission was to do a convoy every day, go down to the mass grave sites, make sure nobody disturbed, uh, disturbed it and drive back. Yeah. You know, and the high point of that entire mission, which took place over a month, so they got into an accident with guys from the 82nd Airborne, and they got into a fight on the road. And I had to do a 15-6 investigation to sort out who hit who. You know, that, yeah. that, was, that was the high point of that mission. So, and they yeah. were tasked to kill cats on a camp or whatever, too. Do you remember that when they were the extreme? Oh, the dogs. No, they, they <laughs> gosh, we got to clear all these dogs off. So they just hand out seven or, you know, 20 Maddox handles and tell these soldiers yeah. to just go beat them to death. I mean, that's just inhumane. That's just, that was to me, again, that's poor leadership. That's insane. Yeah. You know, yeah they should have yeah. made it with, with the vets. The vets could have been down there. You know, there's all kinds of different yeah. ways they could. Well, and, and plenty of those units wanted those dogs. So not, we did, right. I was on a unit, we had vets and they just inoculated the dogs and they were a great right. first alert. Like who's better than that, right. you know, especially in that area. Right. Right. Um, right. But I, yeah, it's interesting. The amount of, of intel you can collect that is not based on threat that, that gives you a much more realistic picture of what's going on. Let's talk about um, 
the messaging aspect of, of what we do and what you've done, because that's also interesting. Because Again, the message is, is that we're winning internally. I come back and go, hey, uh, you think you were winning with farming, but I can't find a farmer that's actually using these practices. Yeah. So talk a little bit about how that works and, and with what we do. Well, that's, that goes into the, the, the entire problem that we're facing with it, with the, and the media is all over this with misinformation, disinformation, the, the fake news, you know, all, all that kind of things, that, all those things, kind of things that are coming up. With, you know, my last tour in the Army was chief of intelligence for the land information warfare activity. And it's now called, you know, for the first, I, first information operations group. And the key of, of that is we were the first, first people to really grasp what it meant to deceive somebody, what it meant to do psychological operations as a, you know, as a coherent combined effort. We'd already, you know, the army had been doing it for, for decades, uh, you know, pra- doing different practices, especially during World War II. But it was the first unit that was solely dedicated to warfare in the information spectrum, not, uh, you know, uh, not, you know, outside of combat arms. And, right. It, it hit upon me the the amount of things that we were working with, the, how to deal with lie, lies. Uh, one of my you know, one of my bosses that that I knew him as a, a contractor there, and then I ended up working for him for a short time. He's actually like the the national chair at DIA for the uh, uh, understanding deception, foreign adversary deception when you're being lied to. Uh, great guy, I'm still in contact with him, and. and you know, we had the, these systems down, but it was everything that was going on was just strictly within the DOD national security sphere. And now you're seeing it, you know, deception and censorship and, you know, this, these kind of information wars essentially going you know, all throughout our society and culture. And that's really been, I guess, the, the scariest part is, you know, is, is when we did when I did that 20 years ago, I should have recognized that it was coming, coming to everyone else. You know, the, uh, one of the things we've seen most recently in the last couple of days is this narrative switch that the Republicans, and this is not a political conversation, it's just an example yeah. of the bald right. face lie, right? That right. the Republicans were behind the defund the police movement. I mean, this is right. patently, right. I, I can't, I already can't take Democrats seriously. I'm not a big fan of Republicans, but I can't take Democrats right. seriously because because of things like this. We're like, you just said, not right. even a year ago, defund the right. police. And now you're saying, these are the kind of things where, because of tribal beliefs, you know, we, we one side believes, one, or with the fact that we couldn't yeah. discuss a, a Wuhan lab outbreak, which a lot of us were like, <laughs> until you can prove otherwise, that is a viable outcome. I'm not saying it happened that way, right. but. I'm not going to trust. The, right. I don't trust us. Why would I trust the Chinese to right. get this right and not lie about it? Right. And that and turns I, out very likely. And I've written about this, and, and I'm continue. I continue to write about this because there's so much to, to un, you know, to unpack here with with yeah. censorship and how that goes. Uh, I mean, the first thing was we as news organizations started introducing fact checkers, and yeah. you find immediately that the fact checkers are are you know relatively you know, they're biased themselves. And yeah. then you, then you, they start introducing sensors. And it's like, and, and the thing is, is every time you put in something like that, a, a, another barrier for you to seek information or the truth, it's all you're doing is you're adding in another layer of bias. So even the sensors were biased against the Wuhan lab theory. And, you know, and I got stories about how it said that Facebook blocked 18 million posts or something like that about, uh, you know, that related to misinformation about the COVID virus. And then a week later, they lifted their their censor, censorship of the Wuhan lab theory. But what what was the deciding process that said, we here in the, in the polls of Facebook in, you know, in the middle of California, we know better than everyone else right. there, that this is misinformation. Therefore, we're going to, we're going to censor this story because it's, it's misinformation. And that's that's the crux of what's the problem with censorship overall. Is you know you do, you on a daily basis you're you're dealing with misinformation, whether it's just inaccurate stuff, inaccurate data, or you know malinformation, which is really is what you could call it spin, which is this. Well, they're actually telling the truth, but they're saying it in a way that makes the, the context of it untruthful. What what censorship does? It's like the carpet bombing. Uh, you know, solution to getting rid of misinformation, right. and it destroys everything. Like instead of instead of using rational arguments, logical reasoning, 
we don't trust that the consumers of our information are smart enough to do that because we're so smart. We're the ones who are going to decide for them. Therefore, we're going to censor this. And that's 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 even at, at the best end of censorship. The, the worst end of censorship is we know this is a lie. We want this lie to propagate. And we don't want any scrutiny of this lie. So we're going to censor to make sure that this, you know, that our BS gets out there and the, and the other person doesn't even have, have room to argue against it. That's, that's about the worst thing. Again, that, that's the more nefarious way of approaching that. I mean, yeah. and I, I, always, I always throw this question out when I, when I do any kind of talk or discussion. If your goal is to get rid of all the misinformation in the world, how would you know when you achieve it? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, how, how, how yeah. would you know when you've done it? Well, right. we've done it. Everything can be trusted now. Yeah. yeah. No. You yeah. Know, it's it's impossible. Yeah. So, it's it is impossible. And and who who gives someone the ability to be the perfect arbiter of information? You know, you might do your best, well, but you're going to make mistakes. I mean, look yeah. to me, an accurate intel picture, sixty percent. If someone claims to be more accurate than that while deployed, I don't. Yeah. I think they're full of shit. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there were some, there were some times that, you know, quite honestly, we're, you know, I, I was off. You know, I made some reads that were wrong, but the best, you know, the best thing I could do is, is, is understand as quickly as possible when I was wrong, but then have the humility to change my mind instead of sticking to my, you know, story and saying, you know, this, you know, this is, this is the reason why this is happening. It has nothing to do with me, um, you know. Intel folks are wrong a lot. You know, that's that's just the way it goes. What you have to have, though, is the most important thing is, and that's why I say Intel is always for the customer. If there's if there's a customer doesn't believe in what you're saying, then you're worthless. Just like the just like the, your the news organization. I just saw the it was like a Reuters Institute study that said the U.S. now ranks dead last in 46 countries for trust in the media. They burn. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is I, I look at that as, as there's a good part about that and there's a bad part about it. The, the, the bad part is it's like, God, I can't believe we're last. We're, you know, that yeah. really is a it throws shade on, on our me, our media's ability or or, 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 or their, you know, their dec- decades old, um, you know, transformation from being in some people who want to inform to people who want to persuade or stories yeah. that are, are no longer stories to give you information, but to give you a narrative. But then the good thing about the good thing about that stat is not only is our media so horrible, but everybody in the, in America knows it, and therefore we are going to be more skeptical on our our reading of the news. We're going to be more we're going to more critically, you know, if we just had blind trust, I think, the, the, I think Iceland hit the, hit the top of it with like sixty four four percent. We're down in like the thirties or twenty yeah. percent of folks who, who trust the media. I think great. It should be zero. You should never trust the media, and you should always look at every you know every single story with a grain of salt, with you know with looking at a counter argument. Because if they're going to give you narrative, then you're going to need to see the other side. Yeah, yeah. And this is an important point to point out. Like uh, you know, if Iceland's at sixty percent and they're at the top of the uh, top of the list, they still like a lot of people don't trust their media. Right. I mean, not right. too. And the other thing is, is like someone like David Muir, who's widely respected, this is not a knock on him, but when they're reporting on the uh, storm last winter in Dallas, he he talked about the refrigerator trucks coming for all the bodies they're going to have to store. And it was it was clearly done to create fear and like right. capture right. a person because ultimately right. they're selling ads for Cadillac and they're catering to an audience so they can sell. I mean, they're there to make money. I'm not saying that right. needs to be state funded, but. You know, if you are driven to serve an audience and that audience wants cold storage for, you know, that's just an emergency manager doing their job, you know, flexing right. resources because right. we've got a disaster. doesn't mean that it's going to get filled, you know, um, yeah. but it is David Muir, you know, and he's selling this, this fear and it's just hard yeah. to swallow that. Or uh, the other thing, Andy No was banned from, and who cares about SoundCloud, but Andy No was banned from SoundCloud because he's written a book about his reporting on Antifa and the, uh, right. the odious actions that those people take towards him and towards right. society in general. And he right. gets banned for being, this is a reporter yeah. that gets silenced. How, how in the yeah. world, you know, do we take that seriously? Yeah. And that's, you know, and I know that, you know, there is the, the argument that well, these are all private companies. They can censor whoever they want, yada, yada, this and that. 
and, and right that right, legally correct yes it, morally incorrect you know right. and morally wrong and that's you know I, I i can't remember the author's name but i just read a great article about how it's it's not necessarily the 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 rights of free speech that are under attack but it's the culture hmm. of allowing free speech that we need to rebuild the, the culture of allowing socratic questioning of allowing debate of allowing you know, uh, you know rational re- you know critical reasoning and critical reading and writing of somebody else's work and once we start saying that that's not necessary that we need to give all that up well then then we're done as a nation and that's yeah. or we're done as a society and that's you know i can go back and give you several historical examples of of, of societies that thought that they knew everything that there was needed to know and they and they didn't need any outside influence and uh, and therefore and this was this took place in the middle east all through the middle ages and the theory was that if it was not something from islam or if it wasn't from you know coming coming from the islamic people then science and math and you know they were at the top of the world at the you know during the crusades in terms of all these things that western europeans discovered you know from nutrition to astronomy to mathematics all these things that that western society gained from the crusades and and and, and combining these different cultures but then afterwards it, it, there's a, a distinct pattern of, of closing that cult, that culture closed down to the west is like these guys can't offer us anything uh, and then in 1802 or 1801 uh, napoleon shows up with the you know several ships of the line and cannons and simply simply invades Egypt and and takes the, you know, takes the country over with a, and, and the West had been dominant over the Middle East ever since. And it's just because the, the amount of rational thought and questioning that went through, that we went through with the Enlightenment advanced Western society in leaps and bounds. And now we're talking about, let's shut that down because we, we don't want to hear from one side or another because they're just pigheaded. And, that, and the virus is a great example, um, you, know, you know, across the board. Yeah. Why is the virus a great example? Just because of the, the amount of misinformation that came out and not, and not that the, that kind of misinformation came out, but that how much we were constrained at challenging that misinformation. And, and that's, and that came from both, you know, leadership in the Trump administration as well as leadership in the Biden administration, you know, from a national standpoint. But then finding out now that well, I think our Na- National Institute of Health was were requested by the Chinese to get rid of any kind of information that suggested it came from their lab and yeah. they did it for them. I mean, that's that's kind of the, you know, the antithesis of, you know, of academic thought on why why are we supposed you know why are we here to to learn more and progress as a society. I mean, that's just, I mean, it gets really esoteric when you get into that area, but yeah, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different, you know, different problems that we have to, that we're still, that we have to deal with and we've never solved them. You know? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of conversations within that. Yeah. To have because there's so much misinformation. I was watching uh, before we started today, I watched a couple minutes of the, um, briefing president trump was getting from uh from texas at all and talking about the border thing mm-hmm. and you could see the clear spin in there politically you know talking sure. about extremely negatively about the biden uh administration yeah. which in part is fair because it's their administration and everything else but some of that stuff yeah. is this is a systematic problem you're blaming these guys they're just this is a long-term right. problem you know right right exactly and that's yeah. You know, again, that's, you know, the entire border argument is going to go back and forth and back and forth. I mean, I have some ex- extremely strong views on you know, what should be done. But quite frankly, that's it's I'm glad I'm in a position where that is not my job for this particular yeah. piece. You know, that's uh, in my in my work. I try to, you know, you know, I work for American Military University. I try to remain as apolitical as possible. But I still have to I still have to take a very strong standpoint on. The, the way information is is shared and used and, and you know, the, the best place to combat misinformation is in the marketplace of other ideas. There, there's, you know, there is even, an, I've even seen an academic paper that talked about, there's this, here's a solution to get rid of misinformation is we are going to use a technique called pre-bunking. So instead of debunking a story after it came out and arguing against it, 
what we want to do, and, and again, this is the whole problem of looking at misinformation as a virus. And there's lots of articles out there that it's a virus that infects people and it's misinformation spreads from person to person. Fake news goes from one area to another because of your confirmation bias. You're going to spread Facebook stories that you believe in, but they're wrong. But who cares? Because it's what you like. You know, that, so that's it's seen as, as, a, as an infection. And so the so pre-bunking is is it was like it's thrown out as an academic solution to uh, inoculating somebody against against misinformation so that if you gave them a piece of truth and they and you you built up that truth and then when false information came in they were more uh, immune to that false information that it sounds great in an an academic sense but the problem is what if you're pre-bunking them with bs yeah Right. You know, again, it's an, it's another human in the equation that says, you know, we're not going to give you the truth. We're going to give you our narrative first, right? And then expose you to. Well, guess what? That's what's that's called spin at that point. And and the example that they use, and and I'm going to, you know, this is a, another third rail that nobody wants to touch is is the is the one on climate change. And the study that the the academics used was they 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 pre bunked their test subjects, their test audience, by showing them the report that 97% of scientists agreed that uh, climate change was was man-made. Yeah. Well, there are dozens and dozens of academic papers that have shown that that study is was total, that, that 97% number is total BS because it was taken from several researchers just combing through academic papers and, who, and of anybody who mentioned climate change 97% of them said it was human caused. Well, that doesn't take into account the, the 60% of the papers that didn't even talk about climate change right. that they went through. And so there's, there's not, you know, to be able to say that, you know, whatever you're, you know, you can have whatever your opinion on whether climate change is, is, human, is man-made or not, but don't use that 97% argument because it is demonstrably false. And yet this academic study used that to pre-bunk or to inoculate somebody against adverse information you know and that's it's it's almost like i listened to baghdad bob who is the uh the 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 head of the the head of the ministry of information uh, for saddam hussein during the gulf war if i listened to every single thing he said and believed it every other thing coming in that showed the u.s forces just trouncing through iraq uh in the second gulf war i would i would be in disbelief of it because i've been pre-bunked by somebody who was telling me total lies the entire time so again, it's another another way of somebody saying well, we got a solution to that, and it's like, look, if the solution does not include rational argument, logical thought, and critical thinking, it's, it's not going to work. Yeah, and yeah, if you can't have some rigor, if uh, if you've got a univariate solution to a multivariate problem, we've got it's right. like race. If you use race as a univariate solution to things, then then you've missed out. Thing. I mean, someone talked to me the other day about the black white um, pay gap. Like, well, first off, what's black? What's white? And then, uh, by the way, how, what's the average age of these groups? Because that's how you instantly start to close that gap. You're like, well, obviously people who are older have more experience, make more money. Uh, okay. White people are older in this, in this. Okay. So that, uh, that shrinks. The, and all of a sudden you've got this gap that's not based on race. It's based on a variety of factors. Cause that's just like, if we're going to do something about climate change, well, we can't seem to kill drugs off. We can't seem to get rid of poverty. We can't seem to, you know, we have all these wars on things. What makes us think we're going to do any better? Another uh, thing I wanted to touch on is because uh, we're about to see this in a couple of days. Is it's just about Fourth of July. Uh, we're going to see a bunch of postings of Frederick Douglass's speech from the Fourth of July, and it's a classic example of this. Yeah. That is a thirty-nine page speech. It takes about an hour to deliver. Right. You're going to see a two-minute piece of that, and if you know anything about Fred- Frederick Douglass and how eloquent he is, mm-hmm. he knows exactly what he's saying. He's making a larger point. And yes, there is a, a searing, hot, well-written, beautifully powerful piece where he talks about, you know, United States and the problem with race and, and slavery. However, the, there's a whole other section where he talks about the beauty of the United yeah. States. Right. And so that, that's a classic right. example of we're about to all get inundated with bullshit. It's abridged. Right. James right. Earl Jones right. can perform it all he wants, perform the whole yeah. goddamn yeah. thing, you know? Right. Well, you know, that's... If you think about 1860s, 1876, you know, the, these community fairs, that they, they featured hour-long oratories. 
Right. And in fact, the Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address was 90 seconds, yeah. but it followed three hours of the previous speakers. Just, you know, that's that was the entertainment. That, that That's the podcast of the 19th century. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you took every podcast you've ever done, everything you've ever said, took two minutes of that, they could have you swearing allegiance to Mao Zedong and yeah. telling everybody you're a pink turnip. I mean, it's... You, know, you could you could put something together that just makes any kind of wild argument that you want. Um, I, I hate to say that, but there are people, there's an entire industry that excels at doing that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they create that influence, which is ultimately circling us back to where we start is this psychological operations, information operations, and trying right. to create the, uh, the affect. I always talk about affect over effect, the affect that you want. Because you can put out a bunch of BS messages. If no one cares or believes you, then, then you're, losing, you're losing your affect battle. Right. Um, can we talk a little bit about cold cases? I know you're under some yeah. kind of and everything, but let's um, let's yeah. talk about what you've been working on and and what's okay. going on. Well, we're we're there's there's four major cold cases that we've been working on. In fact, the the, the one for DB Cooper, we've been working on that one for what is what year is it? Ten years. Sure. We've been wow. Working that well, at least at least I've been involved with that one. And actually, uh, the Tom Colbert, who we had on last year sometime. The um, that one is now filming for a premium streaming service that will come out in February. Um, can't tell you who it is or, or which streaming service it is. It, service it is, but obviously it's 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 a big one. Uh, that one is going is going great, and I think that's you know it, you'll get done with that one, and you'll and you'll get to the point where look if the guy that we've identified didn't do it, OJ Simpson did it because we have so much information on this guy, what he's done, and everything else. The other ones we've we've finally made the announcement that we're actually working them, and there's a, a website that uh, Tom Colbert and his wife uh, Donna had put have, have put up. It's called thecasebreakers.org, and it, it basically announced. We put out it started a couple of weeks ago, but we are working on the Zodiac case, we are working the Jimmy Hoffa case, and we are also working a a a branch or a portion of the Atlanta child murders of 1979, 1980. And in each of these cases, they, including the Cooper case, we've, we think we've gotten to the solution of them because we've tried a totally different approach to each of them. And that's, and that's reverse engineering one of the hypotheses from using a tip off or a spark in the investigation. I think a lot of the, folks who do cold case investigations, one of the reasons why they, they get frustrated and, and never solve these is because they they approach the investigation of that case in the same manner. They look at, all right, here's all the things that happened up until the crime was committed. And now after the crime was committed, it branches off into all these different theories of who did it. Now let's, let's just investigate each of them, but they're doing it almost in a, in a sequential order so that they run into the same dead ends that, they, that folks ran into decades earlier. What we've had in each of these cases, we've had somebody approach us and say, I think I know who this person is. And they've given us some key piece of physical evidence or, or testimony that says this is the guy. And from that point, all the other hypotheses, you, you, instead, of, instead of them, all the different hypotheses competing with each other, you just take the one that you had that piece and you reverse engineer the investigation. It says, let's trace this then back. Is this the guy that did it? And in three of these cases, we think we found the solution. In the one of them, the the one for the Atlanta Child's murder, it's that one has gone so far off the rails of where we thought it was going to be. So our, we even we just disproved our own initial hypothesis wow. that we are now in a totally new area and it's involving a whole set of new uh, folks that we that that we needed to research and talk to and look at. That was really going to, uh, uh, you know, turn some turn some heads and turn some ears as soon as we can come out with that. Um, we, you know, the other cases are again the Zodiac and the Hoffa case. Those are essentially your your holy grail cases of or your holy grails of cold cases. And there's entire society set up to to you know putting those pieces together. And there's lots of theories left and right. Uh, you know, some of the some of those, uh, uh, like the Zodiac case, we think we we think we are on the cusp of of actually solving this one. Uh, the Hoffa case, less so because you know, in, until somebody sees physical evidence of yeah, there he is, it's it's right. will never be solved. So, 
Uh, for that particular one, it's again, we're working off of a tip off. It's in a completely different direction than anybody else has ever gone in because the tip off told us to start in another direction. Mm. Uh, but if, if we are able to find physical evidence or and corroborate it with the physical evidence we've already received, you know, then we'll, then we'll have solved that one. But that one's, you know, if I, if I got to be really skeptical about any of them, that's I'm retaining my skepticism on more than anything else. The uh, interesting thing about all of this, if you watch 2020 or any of these shows that profile cases, we often see when the police get fixated on a topic, on a subject. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm very close to a, uh, a murder case. I think we talked about it, the one um, where it's triple jeopardy. They, they try the guy. They, it's turned into a mistrial. They try him. He's innocent. And then the Army pulls him back in and tries him again. Right. And now he's still in jail. And there's essentially no real evidence. But once he became the guy – actually, there is evidence. There's DNA evidence under the fingernails of the, one of the victims. Mm-hmm. And the military will not test it to potentially right. exonerate or confirm. And actually, right. I, I think it's, it's something like, it's they know it can't be his DNA or something like that, but they won't try to determine whose it is. Gotcha. So these things are crazy. So you see this all the time where someone's exonerated, but like we still got that our eye on this guy because we right. still, he's somehow involved. And so they, right. they look, and I wouldn't be any different. It's really yeah. hard. You need to have this, yeah. this less passionate, you know, you're not fighting for a victim, you're fighting for the truth, I think, is, is right. my assumption and why you guys are able to take a new turn and follow the evidence where it leads you and then back out and approach it from another angle again if it needs to be. Right. And part of what, what we're doing besides is taking a new analytical approach to it is we now also have two new two new tools at our disposal or capabilities. And one of them is, is the crowdsourcing aspect. Mm-hmm. And, and so for these different cases, there, you know, it's there is a lot of subject matter experts that we've pulled in for uh, for all of them. We've we've we're talking to anthropologists. We're talking to code breakers from the Vietnam era. We're talking to just all kinds of different subject matter experts, even geospatial experts. I got a gal who's who's helping me uh, in North Carolina. Fantastic. Uh, recent college grad, a different generation of analysts. But is go- but she's going to look at things much differently than you or I ever would. Yeah. Right. And, you know, so that's the first piece is the crowdsourcing. I don't know if you've ever seen there's a, a series on Netflix called um, uh, Don't F with Cats. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I watch the whole thing. Fascinating. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. that's a, a prime example of how, co- how how crowdsourcing can work. But but again, crowdsourcing is like bringing together, th- you know, a thousand cats into the room and figuring out, all right, now figure out how to pick this lock. You know, you really got to. And you can show, and, and and even though that was just, it's just a horrible, disturbing case, you know, through and through. But I was looking at it from a from a cold case, you know, investigator standpoint, where you had all these folks who wanted to help. You had, a, you know, dozens of folks online that essentially were cheerleading the effort to go find this guy worldwide. And some of them were finding bits and pieces of information. But when you really got down to it, it was only a core team of two or three folks that you had to have essentially, they essentially became the case managers. And without that kind of management and leadership that they, that they just picked up impromptu on them, you know, on their own, uh, they, they never would have, they never would have identified some of the key pieces in the, in the catching this guy. And that's, you know, it's, so I, I mean, I look at it as, you know, you can look at it as like, Oh, this is just a horrible thing. It's going to keep me up at night. And, and, you know, here's me, I'm looking at it from a, you know, critical standpoint. Like, well, how do they manage this? Or well, how was the communications like on that? You know, so I'm looking at it, I hate to say it from a lessons learned standpoint than anything else. That's a great way of, you know, the first piece. And the second and the second piece that we have is we now have data mining tools that can sift through some of this old information and look at it in a different way. Yeah. And an example is, you know, one of the lo- one of the locations, geographic locations, we think one of these crimes mm-hmm. occurred. We have photos from uh, 20, 30 years ago when around when the crime occurred. And we're superimposing that imagery over what the that that looks like today from an overhead imagery shot, and it tells us a totally different story of what we initially thought in the first place. Mm-hmm. Like, well, wait a minute, things by by looking at that, things are now completely changed, and now we got to look at this crime in a wholly wholly different manner because we now have the tools to physically look at the environment and how it's changed over the decades. I suppose there's also the aspect of I watched that uh, David Berkowitz, um, a Netflix special, yeah. Yeah, and, so. and there's powerful stuff in that where 
if the institution does not want to allow a certain outcome to happen, whether it was legitimate or not, you've you've got this you've got this problem of something. To, you know, there's a greater good for the in this case the police union or whatever it's going to be. Right. I, yeah. I don't know if David Berkowitz acted alone or you know in tandem with other people, but there's right. a whole lot of doubt according to that doc and documentary slanted its own way. But these things right. these things definitely have a lot of players in them that want a certain outcome. Um, yeah. We're, we're we're not done with this uh, Derek Chauvin case. We're not done with it. Right. It's no. going to continue to come back, and it will appeal for years. As we've seen with the Bill Cosby case today, the yeah. more you fuck with the case, the more you you try to influence it outside of the jury box, you know, and outside of the courtroom, the right. more jeopardized that that conviction is going to be. I'm curious uh, because I, I come from Benicia, and one of the murders happened on Lake Herman Road, which is. Benicia, and then it, yeah. right around the corner from that, about a mile away, is Blue Rock Springs, the golf course where I played golf on. I know that parking lot where those kids were killed. Yeah. So I, I know these. Uh, I know these cases. Blake Barry S is a place where we all went to. So I'm really yeah. knowledgeable on this thing. Gray Smith did a lot of work, but he's first mover, and so he uh, he had the interesting benefit of going look. Napa, Vallejo, San Francisco. None of you guys talk. I'm able to put these things together, but only because you barely let me do it. Nowadays, right. you guys are able to really get after this. One of the confounding things is, is every time they think they've got, you know, like it's cinched, it's going to be this guy. Yeah. It's never that guy. And there's some kind of fatal flaw. And again, right. we, we don't want to give up uh, Arthur Allen Lee because we're like, no, 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 it has to be him. But but it's not yeah. him. You know, right. right. I mean, that's, you know, again, you may have the, the communications pipelines or technology has opened those up, but you, you're never going to get around the parochialism of, of different departments wanting to protect their own or. Or, or somebody who has their theory, they've sold, you know, there's folks who, you know, they've sold books on this, on these right. crimes. You know, that's, you know, they've, they've posited, this is my theory. And anything that comes out of it is like, man, I don't want my theory to get washed. I just, I mean, I'm still trying to sell books, of, you know, on this that says something else. You know, so that's, you know, that's one of the, the issues. We're, we're trying to keep things as, as close knit within a very small group as possible. Um, yeah. Again, most, you know, the, the, the great thing about what Tom Colbert is trying to do is, you know, these cases are just, you know, at this point, they're historical in nature. I mean, yeah. 50, 50 years old or, or, or around that time. Right. But, you know, we have hundreds, you know, we have hundreds and thousands of, of cases that are unsolved every year. Yeah. Yet we have yeah. an entire, you know, industry of folks in the private sector who just like to do investigative work to retired uh, police investigators, FBI agents, investigative reporters. It's like they may be retired, but they're still interested in doing this work. There's there's there is no apparatus that can bring these folks together and, and you know, heard these heard all these cats to be able to solve. You know, there could be a case, a cold case group in every single state, you know, or and that's one of the things that we're trying to do on the side with my university is to create a, a fraternity for cold case work. Because, you know, the average age of our student is 32. And a lot of these guys are investigators, right. you know, besides being our students. And right. so. What a great way to do some some work with them. One of our, uh, I think I brought on uh, Jennifer Buchholz when, when she came up. You know, she's on her next case as a private investigator. You know, working this, and, and she's she's you know besides uh, besides being on our cold case team, especially on the Zodiac case. Uh, you know, we just talked yesterday and just you know, going through the, the the pros and cons of crowdsourcing and how difficult that can be if there's no controls in place. Yeah. Well, and that Zodiac Killer site is a treasure trove of information, you know, yeah. and you can yeah. go through and dig through that stuff. And but you're going to get very, they all have their guy. They all yeah. have their guy, you know. Well, yeah. And I've, and we're finding in a lot of, in these cases that every one of them that we've got has not been somebody on the radar. Mm. And and, be, and you can't just solve a case by doing research on the Internet and say, yeah, I think I got it. Uh, right. This this each one of these cases has required old fashioned gumshoe. You know, we've even brought a you know some flowers to a, a woman, and and that's related to the uh, to the Hoffa case because her husband was you know was uh, involved so many years ago, and you know so we're we're trying to to get his letters on, on what he might know, and so there's you know that takes you just can't go on a Google search and say I can find this information out. Yeah. Uh, you you got to go talk to that person. You got to get their permission. You got to you got to dissuade them from any problems that might be caused or, or their, you know, or their fear of repercussion or anything like that. Um, you know, in every case that we're dealing with, there's not a single person that's still alive that's involved, directly involved with it. 
Um, yeah. Know, except for except for the Atlanta child murders, I take it back because. Uh, Oh yeah, uh, Williams, right. Williams is still in jail. Still in jail, yeah. Uh, either of the Kennedy killings are the either of those solvable? They both have so much doubt to this day. I, uh, you know, I think those have been, you need, and you get into the point where some of these cases have been had had layers and layers and layers of misinformation laid over them. I don't think you're you're in Hoff is the same thing. It's like you, we may never find right. the truth, and there's there are. I want to say it's like some of these cases have just become Al Capone's vault at this point. Mm, you know, it's yeah. like it's it's the the we'll know the answer when when God tells us, you know, yeah. and, and and for 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 all of us, that's not going to be until the next life. Right, 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 right. What else do you want to uh, What else do you want to cover? You want to ask me anything? Um, no, I'm 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 good. I mean, I I usually give you know I I do webinars on a on a regular basis. This I. I I have one I'm going to be doing for our schools uh, fairly soon on misinformation and censorship, but uh, it's, it's all, you know, plugging away, doing doing what I do every day anyway. So ho- hopefully I just wish I could tell you more about these cases, but I'm just, cause I'm, I'm just, I'm just so excited to talk about some of these that go on forever. I know. I know. Well, we'll, we'll get to it when, uh, when you guys are able to talk about it, I'm excited yeah. to talk about it, especially Zodiac. Cause I've just spent, you know, look as kids, when we drove in that road, we could terrify ourselves on Lake Herman oh, yeah. Road that the Zodiac yeah. killer was out there. Um, it was a threat every Halloween that something would happen. You would see the yeah. symbol painted everywhere because it was yeah. it's part of my upbringing. So I'm uh, yeah. I'm excited about it. Um, all right. Well, then, yeah, let's wrap this up. We'll have you on as soon as you got something to report. Bring Tom yeah. on, whoever it is. And, and just again, thank, it's always so much fun to have you on and, and to be able to hang like this. It's great. If, if we if we have something, uh, I may be able to come out there and do it live with you, Jose. Perfect. I got, I have a tent, I have a couch, I have everything we need. All right. Very cool. 